In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I sit here in the little grotto in my hometown church of Clinton, Mass., St. John, the guardian of Our Lady, church by the great ancestors of the faithful departed. I think so much of my granddad, James Hastings, who was so much a part of that early new evangelization of the Catholic Church. I think of my dad being such a pillar of this particular church on the altar as a lector for 45 years plus. Both my mom and my dad were catechists here in this particular church for many years and did great honor and service to Jesus by proclaiming the truth of the Catholic faith. I will be faithful to those words of our Lord through Mary and keep my teaching faithful to the Catholic Catechism to now honor my parents, John and Mary Kilcoyne, with my ministry in gratitude for one great life lived. Amen. Talk Catholic. And now Talk Catholic with Tim Kilcoyne, a show about faith and other teachings. TalkCatholic.com, and it is the last Saturday of the month, which usually I reserve for Saint of the Month, but we had a little bit of a part one Saint of the Month for Valentine's, and now i just like to do a, a, a short part two. Some of the saints, of course, don't leave us with a body of writings that we can reflect upon, and we're really just able to ponder their life, their bio. So let's do that with St. Bridget today. And then we'll get back to our topic at hand, lying. We may be on this for many, many months to come. (laughs) All right. And just quick reflections on where we're at. (laughs) Uh, We're in a troublesome time. And during a troublesome time, I can only think of the virtue of hope as that which can lift us up. And I was actually looking at a particular video by Father Meeks, M-E-E-K-S, And he gave a wonderful uh, presentation of the virtue of hope. And the title, if you're looking it up, is Politics is Not Our Religion. And regardless of what's going on in the outside world, and he reminded us to uh, just remember, who is the prince of this world? Not Jesus, the other guy, evil, Satan. So we have to expect that during the course of anybody's lifetime, anything can happen, even the morning of November 4th at 2.30 a.m., roughly, in that outside secular political social realm, the culture, and as we say and have said really since the latter days of St. John Paul II, it is a culture of death that is upon us and increasing. So what is the response appropriately as a Christian, a real disciple of our Lord, step it up. Don't hide or get despairing. Increase your prayer life. Increase your reading of scripture. Enter into deeper dialogue for a longer period of time with our Lord. Be ready for anything. I'm still praying for Christmas miracles. I won't stop. We have to live on hope. I'm remembering an old plaque that my mom used to have, something to the effect You know, three things that you have to have for life to be meaningful. A goal to shoot for, someone to love, and gratitude for all that God has given you. That might not be the quote, but it was a good paraphrase. And I think it summarizes in a nutshell exactly what our attitude needs to be during a time that could see more social unrest, not to mention attempts to rob us of more civil liberties, our free speech, and our freedom to worship as we please. May we keep this place, America, land of the free. But only if there be brave, indeed what is needed now is the the sanctification of Christians, an increase in holiness and courage amongst those who should know better. As Pius V said, all the evil in the world is the result of lukewarm Christians. Think about that. We're never really the majority, but we do determine the heartbeat of the country, for good or bad. We have to pray for those who are in power and could do terrible harm if they listen to the wrong voices around them. So pray truly for the conversion of our political leaders at this current time. But as Father Meeks is really trying to tell us, keep your focus more fully on the hope that is ours in Christ Jesus, in good times or bad, in season or out, is what the scripture really meant. So let us start with a prayer for our protection and where best to protect than our homes. 
I will read to you the prayer that is at the very entrance of my own home, St. Bridget's Prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. May Bridget bless the house wherein you dwell. Bless every fireside, every wall and door. Bless every heart that beats beneath its roof. Bless every hand that toils to bring it joy. Bless every foot that walks its portals through. May Bridget bless the house that shelters you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And don't forget the Magi blessing. If you might have back in January, download a feast of the Magi house blessing, putting the initials of Melchior and Balthasar and Gaspar right over the portal of your entry. And while we're speaking about house blessings, have some blessed candles also. Holy water. Increase the sacramentals all around your house. We do call it today the domestic church. Let's make it look so. Okay, let us go now to St. Bridget of Ireland. St. Bridget was born Brigitte, B-R-I-G-I-T, and shares a name with a Celtic goddess from whom many legends and folk customs are associated. There is much debate over her birth parents, but it is widely believed her mother was Broca, a Christian baptized by St. Patrick, and her father was Dubtha, a Leinster chieftain. Broca was a slave, therefore Bridget was born into slavery. When Dubtha's wife discovered Broca was pregnant, She was sold to a Druid landowner. It is not clear if Broca was unable to produce milk and was not present to care for Bridget, but legend states Bridget vomited any food the Druid attempted to feed her as he was impure, so a white cow with red ears sustained her instead. Many stories of Bridget's purity followed her childhood. She was unable to keep from feeding the poor and healing them. One story says Bridget once gave her mother's entire store of butter, that was later replenished after Bridget prayed. When she was about 10 years old, Bridget was returned to her father's home as he was her legal master. Her charity did not end when she left her mother and she donated possessions to anyone who asked. Eventually, Dubta, her father, became tired of her charitable nature and took her to the king of Leinster with the intention of selling her. (laughs) We think we're in difficult times. As he spoke to the king, Bridget gave his jeweled sword to a beggar so he could barter it for food for his family. When the king, who was a Christian, saw this, he recognized her heart and convinced Dupta to grant her freedom to saying, her merit before God is greater than ours. After being freed, Bridget returned to the Druid and her mother, who was in charge of the Druid's dairy. Bridget took over and often gave away milk, but the dairy prospered despite the charitable practice and the Druid eventually freed Broca. Bridget then returned to Dupta, who had arranged for her to marry a bard. She refused and made a vow to always be chaste. Legend has it, Bridget prayed that her beauty be taken so no one would want to marry her, and the prayer was granted. It was not until she made her final vows that her beauty was restored. That prayer that she made, she lost an eye, and that's how she had the prayer granted. Another tale says that when St. Patrick heard her final vows, He accidentally used the form for ordaining priests. When the error was brought to his attention, he simply replied, So be it, my son. She is destined for great things. Little is known about St. Bridget's life after she entered the church, but in 40, she founded a monastery in Kildare called the Church of the Oak. It was built above a pagan shrine to the Celtic goddess Bridget, which was beneath the large oak tree. Bridget and seven friends organized communal, consecrated religious life for women in Ireland, and she founded two monastic institutions, one for men and one for women. Bridget invited a hermit called Conleth, to help her in Kildare as a spiritual pastor. Her biographer reported that Bridget chose St. Conleth to govern the church along with herself. She later founded a school of art that included metalwork and illumination, which Conleth led as well. It was at this school that the Book of Kildare, which the Gerald of Wales praised as the work of angelic and not human skill, was beautifully illuminated but was lost three centuries ago. There is evidence that Bridget was a good friend of St. Patrick's and that the Trias Thaumaturga claimed between St. Patrick and Bridget, the pillars of the Irish people, there was so great a friendship of charity that they had but one heart and one mind. Through him and through her, Christ performed many great works. I'm reminded in having just recently viewed a movie on Francis and Clare, all about St. Francis and St. Clare and their friendship in Christ very similar to what is being described here. St. Bridget helped many people in her lifetime, but on February 1, 525, she passed away of natural causes. 
Her body was initially kept to the right of the high altar of Kildare Cathedral, with a tomb adorned with gems and precious stones and crowns of gold and silver. But in 878, during the Scandinavian raids, her relics were moved to the tomb of Patrick and Columba. In 1185, John de Courcy had her remains relocated in Down Cathedral. Today, St. Bridget's skull can be found in the church of St. John the Baptist in Lumiere, Portugal. The tomb in which it is kept bears the inscription, Here in these three tombs lie the three Irish knights who brought the head of St. Bridget, virgin, a native of Ireland, whose relic is preserved in this chapel, in memory of which the officials of the altar of the same saint caused this to be done in January, A.D. 1283. St. Bridget's likeness is often depicted holding a reed cross, a crozier, or a lamp. Here's a nice little prayer they add, St. Bridget Hearthkeeper Prayer. Bridget of the mantle, encompass us. Lady of the lambs, protect us. Keeper of the hearth, kindle us. Beneath your mantle, gather us, and restore us to memory. Mothers of our mother, foremothers strong, guide our hands in yours. Remind us how to kindle the hearth, to keep it bright, to preserve the flame. Your hands upon ours, our hands within yours, to kindle the light both day and night. The mantle of Bridget about us, the memory of Bridget within us, the protection of Bridget keeping us from harm, from ignorance, from heartlessness, this day and night, from dawn till dark, from dark till dawn. And here are a few special little tidbits of fact, and sometimes legend, but as my interviewee, Father Jonathan Meyer, says, There are some things that were true and some things that should be true. As Mother Angelica used to say, a little embellishment is okay. In any event, here's some little findings. Her prayer about wanting to be unattractive so that nobody would marry her and her prayer was answered in, as I mentioned, she lost an eye. Well, it was miraculously restored and healed upon taking the veil as a nun. Other little amazing stories from the website epicpew.com. St. Bridget was known for her kindness. She gave everything she had, even if it meant that she was left with nothing. She gave a group of hungry beggars all the food that was left in the storehouse of her convent, and seeing their tattered clothing even gave them holy vestments that had been donated. Knowing her tendency to do this, her fellow sisters at the convent were known to hide costly gifts given to them so that she wouldn't give them away. One day, a leper stopped by the convent asking for alms. Bridget had just received a silver chain from an Irish queen, so she gave it to the leper. Her sisters were not pleased with the act since they had nothing to eat themselves. Bridget asked them to check the place where she always prayed, and they found the silver chain still there as if it had never been given away. Another story. Sometimes people took advantage advantage of her generosity. Once a wealthy young man decided to take advantage of her famous generosity by dressing up like a beggar. When he spotted her tending to her sheep, he asked for alms, and only having sheep with her, she gave him one. He went back to change his disguise and again asked for her alms, receiving another sheep. He did this scheme seven times before the day was over. He thought he had outsmarted the generous saint until the following morning he woke up to find all the sheep had disappeared without a trace, while Bridget's flock had recovered the same number of sheep she'd given away. She is known as St. Bridget of Kildare. She built herself a cell under a large oak tree called Kildara, or Cell of the Oak. A few more girls joined under St. Bridget's direction, establishing the monastery. St. Bridget drove out demons by simply gesturing the sign of the cross. Could that have been the ordination prayer by St. Patrick over her? A popular way to celebrate St. Bridget's feast day is by making a St. Bridget cross. Someone gave me one of these not too long ago in a church as I was praying by myself. Very beautiful. St. Bridget is the patron saint of Ireland. Poets, dairy maids, blacksmiths, healers, cattle, fugitives, Irish nuns, midwives, and newborn babies. And her feast day is February 1. In reflection upon the life of St. Bridget, what we know, I would simply put her in a long line of great holy feminists if we want to use that expression in its most positive connotation, as opposed to what we typically know of today, there is a long line of great and holy women of God all throughout our Catholic Church history. I think of St. Bridget and then St. Clair, St. Catherine of Siena, 
St. Teresa of Avila, St. Kateri, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. It's just a wealth of women in our tradition who prove to the world what it means to be a lady of God, like Our Lady. These women were known most especially by their purity, purity of soul, mind, and body, to such a degree that they were the recipient of many consolations i.e. miracles of grace that were above and beyond the ordinary, apparitions, visitations, all kinds of amazing grace was given to them for their pure love of God. And women today can imitate these virtues just as well as they did. That's the revolution that we need to launch right now in the dark and turbulent times that we have found ourselves. The answer is always purity of heart for God. That's the hope of our country. That is the hope of a renewed church. That is the hope of your soul. And we have the examples of these saints to be able to look to either as men or women, for God's grace has no bounds. Our time calls for holy feminism in Christ. There is the purity revolution that could turn the world upside down for Jesus. May it begin yesterday. This is WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. We'll be right back with Professor Peter Kreft and Catholic Christianity. In our last session with Professor Kreft's Catholic Christianity, we left off on page 271, and I just wanted to highlight again the last paragraph relative to our topic at hand, lying or bearing false witness against thy neighbor, the eighth commandment. He said, the crucial importance of truth for morality is not generally understood today. People are rarely taught that morality is more than kindness and compassion, more than good intentions, even more than love. For love without truth is not true love. Love and truth are equally absolute, for both are divine attributes, infinite and eternal. Truth and love are what God is made of. These two are one in God, and the more godly we are, the more they are one in us. This is a critical distinction and really union. Truth and love go together, ladies and gentlemen. It is not enough to be nice and kind. Santa Claus, yes. He's a great guy. And (laughs) we should all be a little bit like him in imitating the virtues of compassion for the least of these. That's part of God. The other part of God has to do with who he is and making sure that we imitate the truth about him. In every way. And he handed on not only commandments beyond the old laws, namely love of God, love of neighbor, but his life itself was a witness to the truth of morality that we are to imitate. So there are prescriptions for Christian living. There are many that call themselves religious, whose lifestyle is virtually indistinguishable from criminals. They talk a good game, but don't take their toys away. Or in the modern colloquium, those who call themselves spiritual, but not religious. And the reason they call themselves that is that they don't want the ethical code. They don't want to hear about the truths that govern our senses, that we must be subservient to under God. That if we want to live a happy and fruitful life, there is a way, the truth and the life. His name really is Jesus. Jesus has given us that road to follow. And it's a difficult one. And it requires sacrifice and the crucifixion of our selfish appetites. This is the part of God that we shun. We want to ignore. We want to play down. I made a comment in a former show about uh, Pope Paul VI had warned against the use of many psalms that called down God's justice upon the sinful. Any psalm that would highlight God's vengeance needed to be put on the shelf because we can't hear that stuff. It's too disturbing. Well, this is part of God's word. We don't get to choose. This is God's word. And we can't just decide which part of it we like and which part of it we don't. The word of God stands. And we have to educate ourselves in his word and not try to suit it to our image. I've made the comment that when you listen to a sermon, very typically we will hear much about love and mercy. And you'll never hear the word truth. This is what has to be restored because If there's ever a reason for the immorality upon us today in America, it has much to do with ignoring truth. We're not ignoring niceness and kindness, but we are ignoring whether that person is duping us and that they're leading us astray down a path 
to perdition, not heaven. The devil doesn't come with horns. I've said it many times. He may wear halos, but they're not real. The wolf in sheep's clothing. This is more characteristic of the evil one. And therefore, in the realm of truth, what he tries to do is he piggybacks on a half-truth. He knows he has nothing that he can stand on alone. So he has to use something that is of God and then twist it and distort it. Let me give you an example. I would call this the devil tugging on the apron strings. In other words, trying to use something that he knows calls to our compassionate nature. In the realm of abortion, for instance, and back in 1973, it wasn't as if the overwhelming majority of the population were clamoring for abortion rights. They weren't. The rationale leading into Roe v. Wade had much to do with citing the life of the mother as being so precious that we should preserve the life of the mother if her health was being threatened by the baby, and she would therefore be justified in the killing of her own child. Never, of course, looking at it that way, but rather her being immersed in an extremely difficult moral dilemma where she simply tries to choose the least of two evils. The very situation, of course, being utterly extreme and rare, and if looked upon in the spirit of Christian sacrifice, it would be that you would sacrifice for the future life of the unborn. Nevertheless, they would then simply highlight the notion that wouldn't the mother have that right to make that decision in that situation? Thus, the semantic twist, pro-choice, was born. Or how about abortion in the cape of rape or incest? Certainly that calls upon our apron strings as well, of understanding. This is how the devil works, ladies and gentlemen. It's the same underlying evil trick as death with dignity, euthanasia, equals killing the elderly. This evil game has been going on a long time, especially here in this country. We're looking at the net result of a good 50 plus years of our elites in academia, as usual. Those with the brightest minds do the most destruction. It's evil. You're killing people. And yet they're trying to come across as being compassionate. Be aware of the wiles and snares of the evil one. Pray the chaplet to St. Michael to protect yourself against these wolves in sheep's clothing, for sure. And the battle against the wolf, a la St. Francis taming one, is faith. Immerse yourself in God and you will have all the armor you need to defend yourself, the armor of understanding and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Let us go on. Professor Kraft says, The Eighth Commandment forbids misrepresenting the truth. This moral prescription flows from the vocation of the holy people to bear witness to their God, who is the truth and wills the truth. Catechism 2464. As with all the commandments, this one is based on reality. What ought to be follows from what is. The reality here is the ultimate reality, God, his essential nature. Repeatedly, scripture describes God as true. The Hebrew word used, mf means not just objectively accurate thinking and speaking, but personal reliability, trustability, integrity, and fidelity. We are to be a people of truth because our God is truth. In him, truth is perfectly personified. Truth is a person, the one who is proclaimed. I am the truth, John 14, 6. Since God is true, the members of his people are called to live in the truth. Catechism 2465. So anybody, ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't have a desire to know exactly what took place on the morning of November 4th in this country is not living in the truth because they don't care about the truth. And thus we know the source of what motivates them. Evil. So there is no closure there, and if we are a people of truth, we will continue in our pursuit as men and women of God, sons and daughters. This is WQPH Radio 89.3 FM, and I want to highlight next week's first Saturday interview with John Henry Weston of LifeSite News. Don't miss it. God bless. Let your light shine. That is what it's all about here at WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. 
but we need to hear your story. You want your voice to be his voice. That is making the faith known to others. Please, my number is 877-625-3727, Tim Kilcoin, TalkCatholic.com. Say, Mother Teresa told us, your ministry is your work right where you are. Grab on to this microphone. God bless.